Now there arose a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many. Let us get grain, that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax upon our fields, in our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, You are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them, and said to them, We, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brethren, who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brethren, that they may be sold to us. They were silent, and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not so good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brethren and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us leave off this interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the hundredth of money, grain, wine, and oil which you have been exacting of them. Then they said, We will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and took an oath of them to do as they had promised. I also shook out my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not perform this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said Amen and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the twentieth year to the thirty-second year of Artaxerxes the king, twelve years, neither I nor my brethren ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors, who were before me, laid heavy burdens upon the people, and took from them food and wine, besides forty shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also held to the work on this wall, and acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table a hundred and fifty men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations which were about us. Now that which was prepared for one day was one ox and six choice sheep. Fowls likewise were prepared for me, and every ten days skins of wine in abundance. Yet with all this I did not demand the food allowance of the governor, because the servitude was heavy upon this people. Remember for my good, O my God, all that I have done for this people." Now when it was reported to Sanballat and Tobiah, and to Geshem the Arab, and to the rest of our enemies that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come and let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sanballat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall, and you wish to become their king, according to this report. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And now it will be reported to the king according to these words. So now come, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking, Their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. But now will God strengthen my hands. Now when I went into the house of Shemaiah the son of Deliah, son of Mehidabel, who was shut up, he said, let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you, at night they are coming to kill you. But I said, Should such a man as I flee, and what man such as I could go into the temple and live, I will not go in. And I understood, and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me, because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin. 
and so they could give me an evil name, in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, O my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So the wall was finished on the twenty-fifth day of the month, Elul, in fifty-two days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations round about us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letter came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah the son of Ara, and his son Jehonanan had taken the daughter of Meshulam the son of Berechiah as his wife. Also they spoke of his good deeds in my presence, and reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to me, to make me afraid. Now when the wall had been built, and I had set up the doors, and the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah the governor of the castle charge over Jerusalem, for he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And I said to them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot, and while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, each to his station and each opposite his own house. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few and no houses had been built. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Why should a fool have a price in his hand to buy wisdom when he has no mind? A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A man without sense gives a pledge, and becomes surety in the presence of his neighbor. He who loves transgression loves strife. He who makes his door high seeks destruction. A man of crooked mind does not prosper, and one with a perverse tongue falls into calamity. A stupid son is a grief to a father, and the father of a fool has no joy. A cheerful heart is a good medicine but a downcast spirit dries up the bones. A wicked man accepts a bribe from the bosom to pervert the ways of justice. A man of understanding sets his face toward wisdom, but the eyes of a fool are on the ends of the earth. A foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her who bore him. To impose a fine on a righteous man is not good. To flog noble men is wrong. He who restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he was called, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your provision, most excellent Felix, Reforms are introduced on behalf of this nation. In every way and everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, an agitator among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all this was so. And when the governor had motioned to him to speak, Paul replied, Realizing that for many years you have been judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. As you may ascertain, it is not more than twelve days since I went up to worship at Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I admit to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law, or written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward God and toward men. Now after some years, I came to bring to my nation alms and offerings. As I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation if they have anything against me. 
or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council, except this one thing which I cried out while standing among them, with respect to the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody but should have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusulia, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak upon faith in Christ Jesus. And as he argued about justice and self-control and future judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I have an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul, so he sent for him often and conversed with him. But when two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Proverbs reminds us that a cheerful heart is a good medicine, but a downcast spirit dries up the bones. Nehemiah exhibits a cheerful generosity to the poor Jews who have returned to Judah. He chastises those charging usurious interest on loans that push the people into poverty, and then grants the poor an abundance of food from his own table. In addition, he does not collect all the tax due from the people to himself. In his vigorous joy, Nehemiah determinedly finishes the wall of Jerusalem to bring peace to his people. Despite being under arrest and accused, which could lead to anyone into a downcast state, St. Paul says, I cheerfully make my defense. Faith in God brings with it a redoubtable joyfulness, that imbues every saint's heart. It comes from a deep trust in what God says and a concrete reliance on the truth of his word. The truth, when fully grasped that God is in control, makes way for a vigorously cheerful disposition. Do you bring a cheerful heart to everyone you meet?